Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. Today at the end of the episode, we have two stories from Untold Mayhem. I was only going to give you one because not very many people listened to last week's episode, the most important episode ever. That has to do with me not sharing on social media, not doing a good job of sharing in my newsletter, all that good stuff. That was a pretty good episode. You might want to go back and listen to it. There are two stories on that one as well. If you enjoy these short stories, yeah, go back and check them out. So today, these ones are Exposed and The Fine Print. I believe both of them were written when I was living in Vegas. Exposed is definitely set in that area. So check that out. That's also when I was working in juvenile probation and out of prison. So a lot of crime is going through my mind, a lot of seeing a lot of kind of gross stuff, seeing a lot of child molesters, that kind of thing. So that might explain some of my stories. This was not a creative week, not a creative week at all. Well, I shouldn't say that. It was, it didn't go down the way I was hoping. I really wanted to work on Duncan Ralston's, our final last 10 or so death scenes. I just got a message back from him saying, yeah, yeah, that sounds cool. That sounds cool. Go for it. Let's do it. I was excited about it. I was like, yeah, I hadn't been working on all week, ready to hit it. And then nothing. And then the next day, nothing. Next day, nothing. Had all my papers with me. I got the stack. I carry my papers everywhere. I carry this yellow pad in the car with me all the time, along with all the pages that I have printed out so I could work on them. If I go pick up my kids, if I go do whatever, but man, this week just was not a good week for that. I had terrible sleep, probably starting on Friday night. We don't know whether or not it was tied to the neurofeedback I've been doing or not. Could be, could be that maybe we're working, pushing the brain a little bit too hard. So we're trying to find that out. So sleep's affected next day. I'm more of an angry, grouchy person. I'm not as resilient as usual. So I'd been having to go into the cold pool and smoke, yoga, get everything back down. Then I'm much cooler. But so there's a lot of that kind of kind of stuff going on again. The nice thing is I, I don't know whether or not it's because of the supplements I'm taking, because I'm just in a better place because of the neural feedback, but I am able to catch it much quicker when I'm getting to these really negative places. I think it was Tuesday morning was very negative. The night before, awful night's sleep. The night before that was pretty terrible sleep too. And I always feel guilty talking about this because some of my very good friends, my best friends are insomniacs and have terrible, terrible sleep. So my sleep, when I say terrible sleep, it's it's bad enough for me. And I guess that's what, when we're talking about mental health and what we're talking about brain health, it's like, okay, how is it affecting you? What do you need? I guess we shouldn't compare ourselves to other people, but I do feel kind of guilty saying, a terrible night's nice sleep when, but it wasn't enough for me, what I needed. Didn't give me what I needed. I could definitely feel it the next day. So I ended up losing it. My son wasn't able to go to school. Didn't want to go to school. Couldn't get himself to go to school. I was getting frustrated. He ended up going, but it was just a terrible, terrible start to the morning. You know, I was, I was, I had a lot of rage. I just depressed. I was just angry, just very, very heightened, just up here where I don't want to be. I want to be here. I want to be chill. I want to be loving. I want to be kind. I want to be calm. But I was in that state and I got home after driving and I just went to the backyard, took my yoga mat, took my computer. I, I was like, fuck, why even take my computer? I'm not going to get shit done. You know, I just so angry. I wrote to my wife. I was like, please just leave me out here. I'm not going to be around with anyone. I just need time to calm down. It's probably going to take me fucking all day. I thought it was just going to be a waste of a day. But I was five minutes after, 30 minutes after doing that and just breathing in child's pose and just letting everything calm down. I was able to go inside and talk to her. And then I was able to, you know, I sent my son a message saying, hey, dude, I'm so sorry. That was so wrong of me to treat you that way. And so the way I see other parents treating their kids all the time, I'm just not, I don't want to do that with my kids. So I apologized to him. And later at night, I was able to tell him, hey, man, Dude, that was not okay. I know you understand. He understands why I was in a bad mood and grouchy and whatever else. I was like, no, that's still, you know, I apologize. I don't want that. You don't deserve that. And, but what was kind of cool too. So again, 
no creative work, nothing, nothing on ghost land. But my daughter stayed home that day. She had an assignment. She just couldn't get her head, uh, also a migraine. I wrote to her when I was outside. I said, hey, I said, it's beautiful out here. If you could come and join me, I'm having a bad day. I knew she kind of was too and, and in a bad place. So she came out and we had some nice hug and just talked for a long time. Had a really good talk. And then I was able to sit through. So instead of doing my stuff, I just sat with her and helped her get her thing done because that was causing a lot of issues for her so being able to be there for her for that and then i went and picked up myself from school took on a neurofeedback as far as you know it's about an hour drive each way with traffic and then brought him home made dinner and then my son wants to play he wants to play soccer we've been playing a lot of soccer every day he's looking for that he just wants to play with dad he just wants to play with dad so part of me is like Okay, I should go. I should go work. I haven't looked at emails. I haven't worked. I haven't worked. I haven't worked. Work, 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 which is why he doesn't want me to write anymore because that's what it is for him. He sees me wanting to work. But I explained to him, I was like, no, man, let's just go play. Let's just go play. Let's have fun. Let's just do that instead. All these deadlines that I put on myself for writing, they're, they're all false. They're all self-imposed. When I have a co-author involved, then it's not as much of a self-imposed deadline. It's like, okay, yeah, no, we do want to do this. But I guarantee Duncan, I guarantee John, I guarantee Glenn, I guarantee all my co-authors are fucking cool people that understand the ups and downs of writing, whatever it might be, whether it's just simply someone saying, hey man, I got a writer's block, I just can't do it. Hey man, I got too much stress going on, I just can't do it right now. Hey dude, this is going to be a little while. Um, so there's that. that, and that's super cool. That That's awesome to see. And then the Tuesday night, my daughter needed help. I helped her until 9.30 and then went right to sleep. Good night's sleep. And so Wednesday, you know, I was like, okay, that's the day that I have a full day of writing that I could do if I wanted to. But I got a text from my buddy, Anthony, Anthony Johnson. He's the one who taught me yoga, brought me yoga, my workout partner, great friend, spent a ton of time together. Like, six or seven years ago is when we're i don't know i think that's about probably when we started hanging out but it's been a while he called me up he just had a little accident at work he was going to be off the next day asked if i could come out and just hang out so in my head that is a split decision type shit. like i have a lot of work but no fuck that i'm i want to go i want to go see him i know it'll be good for me it's been a long time he's a great friend that is much better use of time i was able to tell jake that he was in the car i'm like hey dude check this out I said, you know how I was really wanting to work and how I'm really trying to get Ghost Land done? And of course he does. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I was like, well, that was Anthony. He wants me to go see him tomorrow. I said, so I'm going to drive, you know, an hour there, an hour back in the parking rain. Thanks, Anthony. But really not a big deal. I was listening to my German podcast, just trying to learn a little, some German phrases and stuff the whole way there and back. I said, but this is what, you know, he asked me to do this. I said, and I'm going to go just like last week when I just offered to help out, help George with his patio. George didn't ask me to help with the patio, but I was like, oh, that's a good thing to do as a friend. It'll be good for me. It'll feel good. Same thing yesterday, talking with Anthony. He was a, you know, we had an awesome talk. Reminded me a lot of shit that I'd forgotten about uh, where I was at when we were hanging out and he was coming over here and helping me with yoga. It was originally was to rehab my knee. And then it's like, that's where a lot of the other kind of healing shit came. A lot of the changes in thinking. And yesterday he was saying, man, he's so, so he, he loves seeing that because that's way cooler than teaching someone jujitsu. Teaching someone jujitsu and how to choke someone out or a certain move or whatever else. That is certain cool. Like that's really cool. And I'm assuming if you were a black belt and you actually got to see the whole development of someone, that would be bitching. But also being able to give someone something that they can use for the rest of their life to bring themselves some calm, strength, balance, all these other different things that often get overlooked in different sports. That he thought that was but he thought that was super cool. So which I do as well. And I tell him, you know, I was telling him also how much that affected George because Anthony was doing it with me. We had some sessions with George a long time ago. George and his sons would come and train with us once in a while. Like George adopted it. And now that's, it's affected his life so much too. In, in such a positive way. So something that we need. In addition to the sleep, I think another thing that's been triggering me or giving me a harder time was just seeing all the posts. I was looking at posts to get into the brain injury group, concussion and brain injury. I just seeing other people struggle. But I shared my struggle there the other day. Even though, again, like I was talking about my sleep being terrible, how I felt that morning, like that was intense. 
that was terrible. But compared to these other people that have had major brain damage, major brain injuries and are so far worse, I was like, do I want to share my little, my little thing? But again, for me right then it was major. So we just do the best we can. And I think that's what I am, you know, I go through so many ups and downs and what's crazy is I was super motivated throughout this whole thing. Like I had uh, some great talks with the SBDC again. They connected me with someone who has 22 years of publishing experience in Germany. And she had so many awesome ideas of what we can do and how she's gonna help me with Germany and find me the right publisher. And then from there, uh, meeting with someone else and we're talking about, okay, and then how do I get into Japan? And if Germany works, we're gonna focus on Germany first. And it's awesome to have the support, awesome to have this guidance. Super cool. Planning all ahead for this October event. Yeah. And so I'm incredibly motivated, very excited. I had to talk with another person from there that was guiding me towards how to take advantage of my nonfiction and how to spread that and, and use it for speaking engagements. I love speaking. He's like, well, why aren't you a speaker? Why aren't you, you know, you've done speaking engagements. You did a guest left trip around. You did these other readings at conventions. You've done, you know, stuff at high schools. You've done, you enjoy talking. So why not do it? Why not get paid for it? So he's walking me through that. So a lot of different stuff going on, fixing the, the business. The contest is going awesome. The newsletter is starting to really pick up. I'm going to get as many listeners as I can into that thing because I want to find the right people. That's what last week's podcast was about. If you didn't listen to it, it was the news, the new newsletter, just why readers and listeners are so important to me. But you know what? That's that. Another cool thing just to to solidify what I was already kind of experiencing my lesson for the week, which my friend George also helped me realize was about just being, having recovery. Like I hurt my hip last week. I haven't been able to do yoga. It's been pretty painful. He's like, but taking the time off, spending, and that goes with work too, and spending it with the family, spending it with people that need it. And then my buddy Eugene called. He said he was reading the book. I think it's called 4,000 Weeks, but essentially saying, you know, that is what we have in our lifetime. There is not enough time to do everything. So, you know, really think about what you want to do and make that the best thing, the most important thing right then. So that's what I did on Tuesday. And that was, I went to bed happy, fulfilled, even though I didn't do the writing. Although I did sneak in some creativeness. Uh, and this is, I, I almost forgot this, but it was very powerful. But when my daughter was outside, we needed a break from her project. I said, well, you're supposed to be in school right now. So let's do something brainy. Let's use our brain for something. I said, would you like to work on our book? Would you like to work on our try not to die? Never want to push her. I ne yeah, I don't want it ever to be something that there's pressure on. I don't think that would be good. Still don't know if this is her right try not to die or not. Well, I wasn't sure until our, we talked about it. Because this is a try not to die at the big top. When she first told me the idea, I went absolutely nuts. I completely, by the next day, I had, cause she just gave me a general idea. Someone going to the big top. And then for the next day I had this entire thing worked out. Like I knew everything. It was going to be super dark. It was going to be, I knew the start. I knew this, I knew this, I knew this. I told her and she's like, no, <laughs> I was wrong. And she fought me. So I was like, okay. I said, that is awesome. That's awesome that you can say that is not what you want to do. Even though it was pretty awesome. Yeah, my idea. It's super cool, but her idea is awesome too. So yesterday or Tuesday, we were talking about it and we did a lot of character development and she was able to tell me, she was a little bit afraid to tell me what she was thinking about the character. But if I hadn't been kind and calm and let her tell me and really assure her that, Hey, whatever you want to do, we're going to do unless it sucks. Like you said, my idea sucks. And so she was able to talk to me about what she would like to do this with this character. I said, no, I said, that's awesome. And one of her concerns was something that she might write with me, might turn off readers, might, you know, cause backlash, whatever else I said, a hey, shit. I don't want to upset any reader, but I also don't give a shit. I want to write whatever I want to write, whatever the story is. So I'm never going to go out of my way to try to trigger someone. I'm never going to go out of my way to try to upset someone, but I will show a piece of life from a certain perspective and then I'll probably try to show it from another one too. So I can say, Hmm, is that right? No, how, what, 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 what would it be like if you were seeing it from this side? You know, I'm not saying whatever's right or whatever's wrong or it, with any of the writing, except for TBRCT, where I say, don't let your kids get hit in the fucking head before they're 14. That one is legit. 
<sighs> so we're doing that with my daughter. That was awesome. And then with Anthony, I brought up yesterday his try not to die in Iraq, which us working on that, I think is six or seven years ago was incredibly helpful for him. We actually talked about it on one of my podcasts. I think it was, I had a podcast prior to this called Unlocking. The quality of it was pretty shitty, but we, Anthony and I had some great talks. And one was how much he had us writing, working on that book, thinking about that book, going back to Iraq in his mind, how much that helped him overcome some of his uh, night terrors that he was having. So, and that for a very long time, pretty intense and what, talking about it. So yesterday I was asking, I said, Hey, is that still the book that you would want to write? You know, is, does that still interest you? You might've gotten everything you'd need to from it just by what we did originally, like just plotting it out and thinking about these scenes, you know, maybe that's enough, but we talked about it. And what's cool about the six or seven year changes, his perspective has changed a little bit too, you know, towards the military or whatever. And in his version, we're either going to have two or three paths. And if he writes it, and if I, I think he will, I, I'm, it seems like it is meant to be, things just happen when they are, I don't know, at the right time. That's how I always take it. So I was never upset about this and never working on it, but this happened. We had this talk. It's like, oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. Then I think this is going to happen. I think he'd be very powerful. I would love for him to do it. And then after that, I would, I could help him write other ones. So I was pretty pumped up about that and whether or not it turns into anything doesn't matter. I hope it does because then that means we'll be interacting a lot more. We'll have a lot more going back and forth. I miss the dude. Great friend, great person. So anyhow, I'm glad that I made the decision to not work. Right. And still get some in. Yeah. All right, so let's get to what's going on this week. I don't even know. I haven't been paying attention to things, but, oh, all right. So we got Try Not to Die in the Pandemic is now on sale. So on Kindle, that is for 99 cents. So it's that $3.99. You can pay 99 cents to read that. <clears throat> that is the Try Not to Die that John Palisano and I wrote a few years back, started the pandemic, when we thought it was just going to be over right away. And uh, John is also the co-author that is putting out Trench Diet in the Wild West, which is the pre-order is up now. Duncan Ralston hooked me up with a lot of his early readers. So right now they're going over the advanced copy and some of my great readers are going over the advanced copy, seeing how many times they die and making sure there aren't any broken links. That's one of the things with so many links in the books going from death scenes, to, uh, you know, back to the original chapter back to the next choice you know there's a lot of stuff that could go wrong so everyone's checking that trying to catch any errors and hopefully we will launch it with a good amount of reviews and hopefully these people are going to enjoy it it's it feels a little strange releasing this one early and it's not that early that comes out in two weeks but all the other try not to dice i believe we i don't think we've shared with anyone that's partly because <clears throat> there was a contest going on for them i think and I was like, I don't know. I just didn't do it. So all these future ones, definitely going to be doing it. Going to be putting out my ARC team. If you want to get on that advanced reading team, please send me a message. Mark at marktulius.com. Shoot me an email. Let me know on social media. I'll be sure to get you a copy of whatever new book I have coming out, whether it's a Try Not to Die or something else. Although right now it seems like it's going to be a Try Not to Die because we got a lot of those coming. I did a little bit of work on the covers for Dark Fairy Tale, Death Fest, and Try Not to Die in a Hellhole, John's short story, which I still need to edit. Sorry, John. Try Not to Die in Brightside and Try Not to Die in the Pandemic are both $2.99 audiobook on Spotify, Apple, everywhere you could find those audiobooks other than Audible. So $2.99, check it out. Make sure you double check that price before you buy it. I don't want you getting ripped off, right? But 28 scene death scenes for even if it was the full $6.99 or $9.99, still a good deal. All right, guys, I think I'm going to get out of here. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I'll try to put it in the newsletter. I have to accept, okay, <laughs> I'm going to do the best I can, whatever it is, with my family, with myself, with my publishing, with it's like, okay, yes, I do have limitations. I'm going to do the best I can. I need to be proud of that. I could also give up. I could also self-destruct. I could also say, fuck it all. That is a possibility. That's, you know, I could do those things, but I'm not going to. I'm, 
I'm motivated, I'm driven, I will have hiccups, but I will overcome them until I don't. And I mean, you guys be like, I knew that motherfucker was doomed, but doomed to die, right? The new series, that's going to be fucking awesome. But we're not going to get into that right now. All right, guys, I'm leaving you with these two stories from Untold Mayhem. First story is exposed. Second is, mm, I forgot. God damn it. Oh, no. Second one is the fine print. They're narrated. I'll put the narrators down below in the notes in case you're interested. Again, this one's pretty cool because it's the multicast. A lot of different voices doing these stories. So that is pretty cool. All right, guys, have an incredible week, and I will talk to you later. Peace. Exposed. In all his years of drinking, Les had never felt this bad the morning after, or this thirsty. Even with his eyes closed, the light was too bright. He must have forgotten to close the blinds before he left to go hunting. Must have forgotten to turn on the air, too, because it was hot as hell. Actually, it was hotter than hell, and he realized he wasn't in his bed. Les eased open his eyes, and the sun temporarily blinded him. He was lying on the desert floor, the left side of his face buried in the sand. He tried to lift his head off the ground and found it much harder than it should have been, only able to raise his head an inch. This wasn't the first time he had blacked out and woken the next day with no recollection of the previous night, and the odds were that it wouldn't be his last. Less was many things, and he hated to admit full-blown alcoholic was one of them. He tried to push off the ground and found his hands were stuck behind his back. He wiggled this way and that, curled his hands so his fingers felt the plastic tie binding his hands together. He was handcuffed. Les attempted to stand, but his legs were pulled toward his back, his feet shackled together by his butt and connected to his wrist. Some son of a bitch had hogtied him. From the feel of it, it was already late morning, and late morning in Las Vegas during the third week of August was no time to be outside, especially for a red-headed Irishman. It had to be already 108 degrees, and he was obviously dehydrated. Les hated Vegas. He hated the heat, hated the desert, hated the people, hated the money. He would have stayed in Massachusetts forever if it hadn't been for his legal problems. Vegas was a big town, easy to disappear in. He wriggled around to test the bonds and realized he was naked. He had been completely stripped, not one stitch of clothing left to cover him. His entire right side was burnt bright red, his freckles standing out an angry dark brown. There was also something spread over his entire body. In the places that weren't covered with sand, his skin had a greasy sheen to it. It looked and smelled like baby oil. He had to get some shade soon, and some water. God damn, he was thirsty. His clothes weren't anywhere on the hill he had rolled down, his track obvious. No wonder his body hurt so much. He almost forgot about his headache, the right side of his head throbbing so hard it felt as if it might burst. He didn't see any rocks on the hillside that he might have hit his head on, but something had hit it. This wasn't a hangover headache. There weren't any rocks on this side, but he hoped he could find something sharp enough to cut the plastic tie binding him. He couldn't turn around because of the way he was bound, so Les threw his head back and his thighs forward in a modified curly shuffle. Although he had barely moved, the pain was tremendous, and he had to keep doing it until he could see behind him. He couldn't just wait for someone to stumble across him. Les jerked again and again. He stopped and closed his eyes, trying not to throw up all over himself. He checked his surroundings, saw he had only moved half a foot, nothing but sand in sight. Les rocked and used the momentum to drive him forward on his next jerk. Now he was moving, sick as a dog, but moving. The desert floor was spinning, his equilibrium upset. Last night's dinner gushed out his mouth, shooting onto the sand, wet chunks splashing back on his face and neck. The rancid smell caused him to heave again and again, until nothing was left. 
Les spit out the strings of vomit still in his mouth. He was extremely dehydrated, especially now, but swallowing his own puke was out of the question. The steaming pink pool sat inches away. The chunks of undigested beef were a reminder he'd been eating a double cheeseburger and large fries while parked in his van across the street from the park. He had washed the whole meal down with an extra large strawberry shake and countless coors. Everything was still a blur, but that had to be what got him in this situation. Les should have known better than to visit the same park three weeks in a row. The temptation of his past success there had been just too much to resist, and now he was paying for it. The puke had completely dried up in under a minute. He had to escape. Les resumed his naked Three Stooges routine, jerking away from his undigested dinner. When he stopped and opened his eyes, he was discouraged to see there was absolutely nothing on the horizon, just mile upon mile of sand stretching as far as he could see. Whoever had rolled him down the hill must have driven him to the outskirts of the southwest. That was one of the funny things about Vegas. Drive fifty yards down a dirt road, and the next thing you know, you're in the middle of the desert. He was discouraged that he'd have to walk up the short hill, but he was relieved to see a basketball-sized boulder lying a couple of feet from his head. With any luck, he might be able to use it to cut through the tie, but first he had to get there. After summoning his strength, Les jerked and rocked, rocked and jerked, over and over, until his hands touched the scorching surface of the boulder. He had to take a break before he tried anything else. Just reaching the rock was an accomplishment. He knew the dangers of living in the desert, had studied it before he made the miserable move. There was no doubt he was suffering from heat exhaustion. The heavy sweating, in those places where the pores weren't clogged by sand and baby oil, the weakness and tiredness, the dizziness and nausea, the muscle cramps and spasms ripping through his abdomen, arms, and legs. He'd lost so much water and salt from sweating his balls off, and he was already dehydrated from the beers. Heat stroke couldn't be too far off. The practical joke, or whatever it was, had gone from being a major pain in the ass to a life-threatening emergency. He could die if he got heat stroke. He needed water. He needed shade. He needed to get the fuck out of his restraints. Even though the pain in his shoulders was nearly unbearable and his skin was being rubbed raw on the scorching sand, Les moved back and forth, up and down, in a continuous circle furiously rubbing the plastic over the sharpest edge of the rock. The fiery lactic acid buildup inside his shoulders soon matched the blazing intensity of the sun. Finally, the tie frayed. A few more seconds of rubbing broke it completely. Les flexed his legs over and over to pump blood into them. He dug his heels into the burning sand and pushed himself upright, ignored the dizziness and the new wave of nausea. The outer half of his right leg was lobster red, with a couple patches blistering. Les tried to get his hands in front of him by slipping them under his butt, but he was too inflexible. He found the rock with his fingers and maneuvered the sharp edge against the plastic binding his wrists. Even the thinnest part of the rock was too thick for the job, and it rubbed against both wrists. Ever so slowly, Les moved his hands back and forth over the rock ignoring the layers of skin peeling off his wrists. He picked up the pace and felt the tie give a little, his work lubricated by the blood seeping through the scrapes. Les looked for some kind of marker over the top of the hill. Depending on which way he was facing, he should be able to see the top of a casino, part of a high-rise, something. All he could see was the oppressive, clear blue sky. It didn't matter, because a minute later his hands were free, wrists bleeding onto his lap, but free. Now all he had to do was get his legs free, and he could get out of this hellhole. The cuts on his wrist weren't deep enough to be life-threatening, but what worried him were his arms. He usually sweated like a pig, but now there wasn't a drop on him. Not on his arms, not on his forehead. Nowhere. Heat exhaustion was progressing to heat stroke. There was a huge bump on the right side of his throbbing head. When he brought his hand down, his fingers were spotted with sticky blood. Whoever had bound him had beat him, but he didn't know who or why. 
Les used the bloody rock to saw through the tie binding his feet and tried to remember what had happened the previous night. The pile of puke reminded him he'd been eating in the van while he waited. He had been waiting for a long time. There had been a lot of kids coming and going from the park, but they were all in groups. Things started to come back to him. He'd polished off a whole twelve-pack when the car pulled in behind him. If he'd been smart, he would have taken off immediately, but there were some good prospects playing on the swings. They were a little younger than he usually preferred, but he was so horny that he was anxious to grab anyone. And he didn't even have to do anything with them. Even if he only flashed one or two kids, he would have been okay until the next week, or at least three or four days. The rock sawed through the tie and bit into his ankles, ripping less out of the memory. He tossed the rock and got to his knees. The hill was only about five times his height, but steep enough to instill doubt about his ability to scale it. To quench his thirst and get some fluid in his dry mouth, Les put both wrists against his parched lips and sucked. The blood was salty and warm, but it was liquid, something wet to clear the sand and puke. It would have to be enough to get him to the top of the hill. After that, he could walk to a house or flag down a car. Someone would help him. Every step was torture. The sun was directly overhead, the sand was fire, the incline, a wall. But he had to keep going. Using his hands as his guide, Les closed his eyes and climbed the incline like a bear. Eyes closed, the dizziness minimized, he took his mind off his body and returned to the night before. It was the car that pulled up behind him, the guy that got out. The cop. A cop did this. The memory was still fuzzy, but he remembered looking through his side mirror and seeing the cop creep alongside the van. By that time it was too late to run, but Les had time to get his ID ready. At least he thought he did. When he closed the glove box and sat back in his seat, the cop was staring at him through the window. The cop hadn't bought the fake ID and demanded to see the wallet, which Les handed over. Upon the discovery of Les's real driver's license tucked away behind some business cards, the cop ordered Les out of the van and had him wait in the patrol car while he ran his info. Sitting in the back seat, Les had been worried about violating parole. When the cop drove a few blocks away to the deserted area behind the park, he ordered Les out of the car. Les should have known he had more to worry about than being sent back east. Les opened his eyes and saw he had almost reached the top. A few more feet and he'd be on level ground, probably less than fifty yards from salvation. Les misjudged his next step and his right foot slid out from under him. His body slammed down onto the sand, his chest and groin scraping along the gritty landscape as he dropped several feet. He turned his head to the side and tried to spit out a mouthful of sand. He wasn't going to make it. The lip of the hill was only five yards up, but those were the longest five yards he had ever seen. Just as he was about to call it quits, he heard someone shout his nickname, Mo. It couldn't be, though. No one in Nevada knew his nickname. Ever since he was a kid, everyone had called him Mo. Not his mom or sisters, of course. They always called him Leslie, which he absolutely hated, or Lester when he was in trouble for trying on their makeup or stealing their clothes. But all the kids at school called him Mo, as if they knew something he didn't. Les crawled toward the angelic voice, buried his hands deep into the sand and pulled himself up a foot at a time. His shoulders and upper arms twitched like crazy, and he would have scars to last a lifetime, but he was going to make it. That bastard cop had taught him a lesson. That was the last time he'd stalk prey at a park, and he was getting out of Nevada. If he never saw the sun again, it would be just fine with him. With one last lunge, Les pulled himself over the top of the hill. He had made it. Now all he had to do was make it to a store, find someone, get some clothes, some shade, some water, a hospital. But he'd made it. Les raised his head and looked to see which way to go. There was nothing in front of him. Nothing to either side, nothing behind him. No savior calling his name. The desert floor stretched for mile after mile, sand and cactus the only things visible. 
Lusk collapsed, barely aware of the blazing sand burning into his cheek, his chest, his crotch. A few feet ahead, taped to a boulder, was a plastic Metro Police Department pamphlet. Lusk had to concentrate to read the slogan. Cleaning up the community, one criminal at a time. The Fine Print Mr. Cohen handed Stan and Gary their contracts, then laid his folded hands on his mahogany desk. Cohen's black suit, blue tie, crisp white shirt, and manicured hands screamed class. But the look was a bit too stuffy for Stan. Stan looked great in a suit, but he'd rather throw on a nice pair of jeans and a snug polo so he wouldn't be too intimidating to women who might want to approach him. Gentlemen, before we get started, let me just make certain that you understand how this works. This is mediation, not arbitration. There is no judge or jury, just the two of you talking out your differences, with me helping you come to a satisfactory resolution. Anxious to get it over with, Stan said, We got it. Gary, how about you? Any questions? Not surprisingly, Gary shook his head unable to assert himself and speak even a one-word answer. Then, if you would both please review the contract and sign and date it. Today is the 30th. Stan turned to the back of the ten-page contract. What exactly am I signing here? Not promising my firstborn or anything like that, he joked, flashing his winning smile and turning the charm on, already trying to get Cohen in his corner. It simply states that the resolution you reach is binding and cannot be appealed. It also waives your right to sue final solution if things don't go the way you expected them to. Stan put pen to paper, chuckling as he scrawled his name. Not too worried about that. I recommend that you read the whole thing. Stan flipped through the pages to satisfy Cohen. Looks like your standard contract. I'd like to get this thing started if we could. Stan looked to his right. Gary was on page three. Come on, man. I don't have all day. He can take as long as he needs. Predictably, Gary folded under Stan's pressure and turned to the last page. After carefully signing his name, he handed the contract to Cohen. Speaking to Stan, but looking straight ahead, he asked, Happy? Stan slid his contract across the desk to the mediator. Very. Let's start. Cohen held up a finger as he checked the signatures. Stan was tempted to reach across the desk and snap the pretentious prick's finger in two. But instead, he sat there with a smile pasted on his face. One more thing, Cohen said as he looked up from the contracts. I'll need both of your watches and cell phones. Stan looked down at his Cartier and shook his head. I don't think so. It's one of my rules. No phones, clocks, watches, or hourglasses. Once this thing is started, we don't finish until we've reached a satisfactory conclusion. Gary handed over his phone and cheap Timex. Stan took his time unclasping his watch. Cohen took it from him and walked to a paneled wall. When he pushed the middle section of the wall, a panel slid to the side, revealing a safe. With his back blocking their view, Cohen dialed in the combination, opened the safe, and inserted the contracts and their belongings. Before closing the safe, Cohen pushed a button that unlocked the hidden door next to it. Stan pretended to be impressed. Wow, look at you, all mission impossible. Cohen pulled the door open and motioned for the men to head down the dimly lit concrete hallway. Not exactly. We just respect our clients' privacy. And can you really blame me for not wanting this ugly door in the middle of my office? Stan glanced about the plush office. You've got a point. Plus, people would be wondering where that door went instead of listening to what you were saying. Gary, who had just entered the hallway, took the bait. Where does it go? Cohen took off his jacket and hung it on the back of his chair. Last door on the left. Stan strode down the long hallway, 
breathing down Gary's back. When Gary stepped into the room and stopped abruptly, Stan stumbled and collided into Gary's back. What the hell, dickweed? Why did you stop? You should watch where you're going, Gary said under his breath. Enough of that. Cohen walked between the two men. Gary, have a seat over there, he said, pointing to the edge of the sunken concrete pit that filled the room. Stan, you take that side. Stan looked where Cohen was pointing. Are you serious? There's no cushion. Take a seat, Stan. Gary walked to his side of the pit, stepped into it and sat on the edge. Stan went to his side and plopped down onto the hard concrete. Trying to make light of the uncomfortable situation, he said, Fill this thing with water and we've got ourselves one hell of a jacuzzi. I'll line up the coos if you handle the booze. I thought you wanted to get started, Stan. Cohen's dry, monotone voice was starting to grate on Stan's nerves. Stan looked away from Cohen and caught Gary smirking. He restrained himself from dashing across the eight feet that divided them and smashing him in the face. What's so funny, you little pencil neck geek? Cohen stepped to the edge of the pit. Stan, that's the last time you insult Gary without there being a consequence. Understood? Don't speak to me like I'm a child. Don't act like one. Stan's blood was boiling. He didn't trust himself to look at Cohen, but staring across at Gary was almost as bad. Now, if you two are ready to start, please place your feet on the markings in front of you. The outlines of two feet were painted on the concrete floor a few inches away from the step. When Stan placed his feet inside the markings, two metal shackles shot out from the wall inside the pit and clasped both ankles. He jumped to his feet and nearly fell over as the restraints prevented him from moving forward. Easy, Stan, Cohen said. It's part of the session. They don't hurt, do they? Stan looked across at Gary, who was sitting there acting as if the ankle chains didn't bother him. He sat back down on the concrete ledge. Speaking to Cohen, he said, You could have warned us. Relax, Stan, Gary said. They're not going to hurt you. Cohen pressed the intercom on the wall and said, We're ready. A few moments later, the door across the hall opened, and two men with wheelbarrows full of wood entered the mediation room. The two men placed their wheelbarrows at the edge of the sunken pit and constructed a three-foot-high pile of logs directly between Gary and Stan. The two workers left the room with their empty wheelbarrows. Stan joked, Where are the marshmallows? Sorry, Stan, but we don't provide any treats. Trying not to sound nervous, but smelling the familiar scent of lighter fluid, Stan asked, So what's all this? It's our way of teaching you both a valuable lesson. Each time one of you says something negative about the other, you are adding fuel to the fire instead of putting it out. Some people have difficulty grasping that concept. Here, at Final Solution, we have made it a little more real. The two workers came back with wheelbarrows overflowing with wood and set them on either side of Cohen. One placed a large fire extinguisher next to Cohen's feet. Stan thought the whole idea was stupid, but he would play along. Oh, I get it. As soon as I say something about him, you light the fire. Cohen pulled a lighter from his suit and flicked the flame on. You're exactly right. Hold on a second. You can't be serious, Gary said, squirming away from the pile of logs. I'm out of here. So you're willing to let all of your claims go? You're going to give the business to Stan? Yeah, Gary, just give it to me. You know I should have it anyway. Gary settled down. I'm not giving you anything. Good, Cohen said, still holding the burning lighter. It'd be such a waste setting all this up for nothing. Discuss your problems like rational men. Let's come to a resolution. 
Hate to tell you this, but I wouldn't call threatening to set a fire between us as being the most rational thing I've ever seen. Stan, we've never had a case come to an unsatisfactory conclusion. What other mediator can promise a 100% success rate? Then let's do it. This smell has given me a headache. Stan looked across the mound of logs. You ready, weasel boy? Cohen tossed the lighter onto the pile, setting it ablaze. He pressed a button on the wall, turning on the exhaust fans installed above the pit. Cohen faced them with a smile. I told you that the next negative comment would have consequences. We have started, gentlemen, and will continue until we've finished. You're crazy! Stan backed away as far as the restraints allowed. What the hell do you think you're doing? These clothes are going to be ruined. Cohen slipped on a pair of black leather gloves, picked up a log from the wheelbarrow closest to Stan, and tossed it onto the fire. Trying not to let his temper get the best of him, Stan said, I didn't say anything about him. You can't get mad at anyone but yourself, Cohen said smugly. The two of you have the power to end this. I recommend doing it quickly. Stan used the back of his forearm to wipe the sweat from his forehead. He looked down and saw that the tips of his $400 shoes were melting. He bent over, picked up the end of a burning log and tossed it at Cohen. Turn this shit off and let me get the fuck out of here before I sue the hell out of you guys. Cohen picked up the extinguisher and sprayed the burning log by his feet. You probably should have taken a closer look at the contract. Always read the fine print, Stan. Stan reached for a log, but his hands came too close to the fire. The lighter fluid that had rubbed off on him from the log he'd tossed ignited, and he threw his blazing hands into the air. Screaming in pain, he looked at Cohen, who was standing there with the extinguisher. What do you say? Please, Stan yelled. Please put it out! Cohen put out the fire on Stan's hands covering the entire front of his body with the white foam. That's a freebie. No more Mr. Nice Guy. I suggest you two get started. Stan started to object, but Gary said, I think we should talk, Stan. Come on, I'm scared. Stan ripped off his shirt and wrapped it around his smoldering hands, hoping to ease the pain. What the fuck you want to talk about? You put me in here, you goddamn Jew. Cohen tossed another log onto Stan's side. What did I say now? Personal attacks won't help you come to a satisfactory resolution. He's not even Jewish. It's just an expression. Jews are known for being cheap. Thanks, but I'm well aware of that stereotype. Gary said, It's fine. Let's just talk and get this over with. It's starting to burn my legs. Gary looked to Cohen and asked, can't we just stop this? We understand. Cohen pointed to the yellow button next to the intercom. That unlocks your restraints. Come to a satisfactory resolution, and I will press it. Gary said, You backdoored me and stole my major accounts, ones I had before we even started our partnership. Now it looks like I'm not bringing anything to the table. My take-home pay is half of yours. Is that why you're stealing? Gary didn't answer. Cohen picked up a log and asked Gary, Is that a true accusation or a false attack? When Gary didn't answer, Cohen threw a log on each side of the blaze. Answer him, you prick, Stan said as he nudged away a burning log. You know you're stealing. I had to. You took all my accounts, Gary said with a whine. You weren't servicing them right. If you had, maybe your clients wouldn't have approached me. I didn't service them right. That's what I said. Gary looked defeated when he asked, Like my wife, you son of a bitch. Is that why you slept with her? It was impossible to tell if it was tears or sweat rolling down his cheeks. Cohen threw two logs onto Gary's side of the pyre. Sit and calm yourself. Stan smiled, even though he could barely see Gary's deflated face through the rising flames. 
Unable to stop himself, Stan said, If it makes you feel any better, we never did any sleeping. Gary cried out and jumped to his feet, forgetting about the ankle restraints and raging fire in front of him. He fell face first onto the inferno and panicked, throwing logs out of his way. His shirt was on fire when he got back on his feet. Cohen doused him with the extinguisher and told him to sit. Once Gary was seated, Cohen threw two more logs onto Gary's side and tossed the extinguisher behind him. No more chances. You two better hurry. Seeing his partner on fire sobered Stan. Trying to regain control of the situation, he said, I'm sorry, Gary, but I didn't exactly rape her. Speaking so low that Stan could barely hear him over the crackling fire, Gary said, You were screwing my wife in my own office. She seduced me. You know she's not my type. You've seen the girls I've been with. I like them young and tight, not middle-aged and saggy. Cohen tossed two logs onto Stan's side. They caught fire and rolled onto Stan's shoes, setting his jeans on fire. Stan brought his shirt-wrapped hands to his pants and slapped the fire out. I didn't say anything, Stan yelled, knowing he wouldn't survive many more logs. Stan, Gary shouted. Let's agree on something. Hurry up. My pants are melting. Stan kicked at the burning logs then set his jeans on fire again. Put me out, you fuck, he ordered Cohen. Cohen stepped behind Stan's wheelbarrow and grabbed the handles. Stan whipped his head back to Gary, whom he could no longer see. Sell me the business for 200000 plus you keep 10%. Gary cowered in a heap of sobbing moans. The fire seared his calves and climbed his legs. You miserable Jew! Cohen heaved on the handles and dumped the logs into the pit. Within seconds, the flames licked the ceiling, engulfing Stan's legs. Barely able to think, Stan shouted, We'll never agree. There's no solution. There's always a solution, Cohen said as he turned toward the door. And this one is fine by me.